Now, what I want to talk to you about today is labor law and its role in the on-demand economy. And I know that some of you in this room might start to get tired of me talking about this because it's very much the work I've been doing for the last year and a half or so in the process of writing a book on the topic. And one of the things about work in the on-demand economy is that it keeps changing. And so it keeps throwing up new challenges. And I hope even those of you who have already spoken about this topic will still find something new, something interesting in our discussions. There's three things I really want to talk to you about. First of all, a sort of definitional issue. What is crowd work? Why is this something that we should actually be interested in? And what are examples of the sorts of businesses, the sorts of platforms that we've started to see pop up all over the world, but also now specifically in different EU member states? The second thing I then want to talk about is some of the promises and some of the reality of work in the on-demand economy. Because one of the really interesting things, one of the sort of big themes, I think, of my work, my research in this area, is the vast heterogeneity of life and work in these platforms. There's some great promises, some great potentials for workers, for consumers, for businesses. But there's also a slightly darker side. There's also some real problems, some real challenges for working standards, for consumer protection, even for existing businesses trying to compete in the marketplace. And I suppose at the end of the day, we're all lawyers, or most of the lawyers in this room. So of course, then the question is, what are the legal responses? And there we have started to see some really interesting litigation, some really interesting policy work, both at the international level. I'll hope to talk to you a bit about what the ILO is up to, bits what the European Commission is up to, but also at the domestic level will be particularly focused on UK developments, but again, countries like France, countries like Germany have seen quite a lot of work in this sort of area. So what's this idea of crowd work? Well, in one sense, it's a very, very new thing. The very notion of crowdsourcing is something that only really came into existence about 10 years ago. So an article for Wired, the sort of geeky technology futurist kind of magazine, this journalist wrote about a new trend where rather than going to existing businesses, for example, to fund a new project or to fund a new startup business, you could go to the internet instead. You could say, actually, I'm going to go to the crowd. Lots and lots of people connected to the computers, connected to the iPhones. And I'm going to ask them for monetary contribution. And that might be a better deal for everyone rather than going through the traditional intermediaries of financial institutions. And this sort of model started to go very quickly beyond finance into all areas of the economy. And very soon people were talking about the sharing economy. This idea that actually if I have a spare car, well, it sits on my driveway most of the day, I'm not using it. So actually be much more efficient in terms of resource use, also better for the environment, also cheaper for everyone, if we started sharing these sorts of assets. Another term that started cropping up was the collaborative economy, right? You see this sort of quite positive, quite nice, interesting language here. This idea actually rather than having a boss and being told what to do, well actually we could all work together, we could all collaborate in a new economic model and the internet, the platforms, the websites, the apps would help to intermediate between different people who want to collaborate towards some project, towards some goal. Today, the term a lot of people refer to is the gig economy. Gig in the sense of a single one-off event, a single one-off job, a task, where you no longer have employment that sort of drags on for a long time, but actually where some people get together, do a particular job, and then move on to the next project. And of course, what all these forms of economic organization have in common, it is suggested, is that they rely on this concept of crowd work. They rely on this idea that there is this crowd out there, willing, ready, keen, waiting to do the jobs. Now, the first thing, the first sort of challenge I think we have as lawyers is to think very hard about some of these labels. 
And indeed, there is already quite a well-established school of criticism now that says, well, that's not really the case. If I'm an Uber driver, I'm not collaborating with my passengers, I'm working for them. If I deliver something with my bike on deli for Deliveroo in Oxford, I'm not sharing use of my bike. I'm working for somebody, be it a restaurant, be it a consumer. And even in the terms of the gig economy, what's really going on is work in an on-demand relationship. And so I think the first emphasis is to say, we need to be very clear that what hides underneath all these labels is a reasonably old-fashioned fixed-term working relationship. What's genuinely different to a large extent is that we now have these apps, we have these online platforms, and they make the matching much easier. They make it much easier for me as a consumer, me as the business, needing somebody to get a job done to get in touch with these large groups of workers sitting behind their screens, maybe waiting in their cars, willing to do their job for me. So that's a theoretical model. Let's just look at one or two platforms to actually get a sense of how they operate. The first one of these, I probably don't need to say very much about. Anybody here used Uber before? Good, I'm not gonna hold it against you. Uber essentially, is a little app that you can have on your mobile telephone that uses GPS to locate you in now a vast majority, a couple hundred cities across the world. And when you want to go somewhere, you say, I'm outside the ERA right now, I want a ride, as they call it, and then their computer systems will connect you with somebody's car somewhere in the vicinity, send it to you, and deliver you to your destination. Now, Uber, in one sense, is really important in this debate. They're by far the largest operator. They're by far the most aggressive operator. They're the ones who, over the past couple of months, have been getting a lot of bad press for everything from their sexist corporate culture to, you know, advising Mr. Trump on his business council ideas. But the important thing is that the on-demand economy is much more than just Uber. So another style of platform you see is something along the lines of Amazon's platform, which is called Mechanical Turk. Anybody used Mechanical Turk before? Lots of academics actually are starting to use it. It's a platform where you can post any sort of digital or electronic task. So a classic example would be if you've got your expense receipts and you want somebody to type them all up into a nice Excel spreadsheet, what you can do is with your phone, you just take photos of all the expense receipts you post them on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and you say, I'm willing to pay somebody two US cents to describe them all into a spreadsheet for me. Or if you've got an audio file, and you want a transcription or a translation of that audio file, again, you can upload a sort of five minute audio clip and say, I'm willing to pay somebody one US cent to actually complete that job and transcribe it for me. A third sort of platform that we see is businesses along the lines of TaskRabbit. Now, TaskRabbit, as opposed to Amazon Mechanical Turk, where the work happens exclusively online, exclusively, as it were, on the platform, and you can be wherever you want to be in the world, TaskRabbit and similar platforms deliver physical services in your home, wherever you might want to be. So, for example, if you need help with your IKEA furniture assembly, that's the sort of thing you put on TaskRabbit and they will send somebody to come and assemble your furniture for you. Walk your dogs, do your laundry, whatever it might be. Similar related sort of products are food delivery businesses, which collaborate with consumers who will order the meal and the restaurants to deliver it to your door. Things like Deliveroo in the United Kingdom, Fedora is a main operator in various countries on the continent. Now, I could spend the next hour and a half, two hours, three hours telling you about all these different platforms. And there have been some attempts by scholars, by policymakers, to try and come up with some sort of classification. As lawyers, I think that's a sort of instinct, that we want things to be in neat little boxes. We want things to be organized clearly. Well, for those people, I'm afraid I have to say, there's no point in doing that. There's a vast heterogeneity of these platforms. 
New platforms are developed every day. For each one of these three models, there are 15 competitors trying to copy them, trying to do the same thing. Even an established platform will continuously keep changing its business model. And the business model might be different in different countries, in different cities. So I think there's no point really trying to say, let's have a clean taxonomy of these platforms. I think what we need to do is, we need to look at what they all have in common which is of interest to regulators, which is of interest to lawyers. And what all these platforms have in common is that their business model is fundamentally premised on the availability of a large crowd to do the work on demand. And that's what they all have in common. And I think that's why they're so interesting to us as labour lawyers, as labour market regulators. When we look at how these platforms operate at first sight and to a certain degree, I think they promise us an amazing bargain. They promise everyone, consumers, workers and employers, a great bargain. So for example, when you think about consumers, they promise us more products, they promise us better service and they can sometimes deliver it at a much lower cost. Anybody who's ever had to struggle with a grumpy French taxi driver or a grumpy London cabbie will tell you stories about the efficiency and the beauty of getting an Uber, the driver jumping out, opening your car, no need to have an expense receipt, it's all done through your phone, through the app. Uber's tagline for a long time used to be everyone's personal driver. This idea that something that used to be a real luxury product is now available to you and me at the touch of a button better service. A lot of these platforms have very sophisticated rating algorithms where each worker, and sometimes I have to warn you, also each consumer, is assigned a particular rating. So when you go and try to find somebody to assemble your IKEA furniture, you don't just get sent the first person to come along. You can actually choose from a list of people who have been rated by previous users to know that, well, maybe Jeremiah can barely hold the drill. I only get a one-star rating on my assembly. And therefore, you can choose somebody else to come. And finally, because these businesses very often don't rely on the sort of traditional overheads, the traditional costs associated with running a large corporate enterprise, the prices offered by a lot of these services are much cheaper than what you would be used to paying for similar services in the more traditional economy. And it's not just for consumers that it's great, it's also for businesses. And businesses, interestingly enough, are increasingly starting to use these platforms to replace the more traditional staffing. Now, one key advantage, of course, for business is the immense flexibility in having a workforce that's available on demand. There's one CEO from uh, Upwork, a sort of big uh, design development platform, who said, well, the thing we can offer you is that you can hire a worker for five minutes and fire her at the end of those five minutes without having to worry about any sort of issues. Indeed, one thing that's really interesting when you talk to sort of senior HR managers in big companies is that they get a bit upset about this because they, they no longer deal with it. It's procurement who are now in charge, you know, the people who buy the paper and the coffee and the tables who now sometimes actually buy in the labor as well because it's become so commoditized that it's a very flexible model. It also means that if there's additional demand, you can very quickly scale your workforce. And depending on what the work is, particularly if it's digital work, you can scale it globally. And you don't really have to worry about where the work is being done. More or less the entire globe becomes the reserve pool of labor for your business enterprise. And of course, it can be much cheaper because you haven't got all the traditional compliance, all the traditional employment norms, all the management issues associated with it. And what we're now even starting to see, we're starting to see reasonably big businesses that don't employ a single worker anymore and rely entirely on these platforms for the workforce. So for example, in the translation business or in the digital transcription business, there's a couple of reasonably sized European and US players now who don't employ a single translator, who don't employ a single typist or transcript writer because all the work is done online through the crowd, through these platforms. And 
and I think it's a very important point to make as well. Work in the on-demand economy even has some great promises for workers who take up these sorts of jobs. First of all, flexibility, right? Maybe you have other duties, whether it might be caring or another job. Well, one of the things these platforms do genuinely enable you to do is to say, well, maybe on Friday evening, I've got two or three hours of spare time and I'd like to earn a bit of extra cash. I'm going to go get in my car, drive around London and pick up a few passengers. In another sense, particularly from the digital platform, sort of Amazon Mechanical Turk style platform, it's great that you can work from home. You have no geographical limitation. So if you have caring obligation, or you might be handicapped, or there might be other reasons why you're excluded traditionally from the labor market. Well, as a famous New Yorker cartoon from the early 1990s said, in the internet, nobody knows whether you're a dog or not. Nobody knows whether you've got a criminal record or whether you can't get out of the house. You can work and you can have access to work opportunities to additional income. Finally, you can use it to supplement the income. One of the really important bits um, in Adam's slides was this rise of second jobs. And I think platforms and the gig economy are a big part of that story. That actually, even if you have one job, it's very easy to go and get additional work. So, sounds great. Sounds brilliant. And actually, people have started to talk about this not just as a new form of work, as an additional way of organizing the labor market. Some of the promises you see out there are much grander than that. People are saying this is the very future of business. This is the very future of the market economy. And you get these sort of great enthusiastic statements as you see up on the slide. It's not just the Freedom Economy Report of 2016 says about a gig or sharing a resource. It's about freedom. It's about autonomy. It's about self-determination. No more nine to five jobs. No more bosses. We're all entrepreneurs. We all get to do what we want and make a great living of it. Well, as with most things in life, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And this is an idea that under the sort of great story of the on-demand economy, just as with every iceberg, there's also something else going on underneath the surface, which we can easily see. And what's going on underneath that surface is what I like to call the development of humans as a service. Sadly, at this point, I have to admit to you that I didn't come up with that phrase. I wish I would have come up with that phrase. It so neatly encapsulates, I think, the on-demand economy business model. The man who actually came up with it was Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. And he was talking at a conference at MIT a couple of years ago when he was saying that Amazon had managed to disrupt a lot of traditional businesses. No longer did businesses go out and buy storage for their data. Amazon could now offer storage as a solution, storage as a service, which you simply accessed through the internet. The same a couple of years later with processing power. If you need a big data, it's a lot of computers to crunch a lot of information, you used to have to buy very expensive computers and have them in your business to be able to have access to that processing power. Well, today, Amazon is actually selling computing power as a service. And so, Jeff Bezos said, the next big frontier in his business model was to be able to get rid of traditional employment, traditional work, and to use the internet, to use these platforms to deliver humans as a service. And I think that is where it gets really interesting for us to think very hard, not just about the promises of work in the on-demand economy, but also the reality underlying it for consumers, for workers, and for businesses at large. And here it gets interesting to look behind this language of entrepreneurship and innovation and ask ourselves, what is the reality of work in the on-demand economy? Well, the first reality of work in the on-demand economy is this idea of algorithmic control. That actually, rather than freedom and entrepreneurship, you've got a new boss, and your boss is an algorithm. 
I've already told you about the ratings, right? This idea that every time you use one of these on-demand services, afterwards your little app, your little phone will ask you, well, how good was the driver? And you can say, well, maybe she was a three out of five, maybe she was a five out of five. And then future users actually see the rating of these workers. And the companies also use the rating to decide who to fire or who to promote to better jobs. So in most cities, for example, if you're an Uber driver and your rating falls below 4.6 out of five stars, you get sacked. And of course, you don't get sacked in the traditional sense with you know, being sent to P45 and having a meeting with your manager. Your app simply stops working. And when you try to log in the next time, it simply says, sorry, you're no longer required on this platform. But algorithms today in these platforms do much more than just reflect quality. Algorithms are used to exert extremely tight control over the workforce. For example, in terms of compliance with policies of the platform, Uber now uses the accelerometer in its driver's iPhones to measure how fast they accelerate and how hard they brake. And if their driving is too abrupt, then again, they might be told that if you don't stop doing this, you will be terminated. Because our passengers want a smooth ride rather than your crazy stop go across the Parisian traffic. Algorithmic control is also used in platforms where you do online work to make sure you're not wasting anyone's time. So when you use platforms like MTurk or Upwork, where you do the task purely online, you agree to install a little bit of software that takes a screenshot off your computer at a random interval every couple of seconds to make sure that you're actually doing the job you're being paid for to do. The second reality where we have to start questioning these issues of entrepreneurship is when it comes to setting the wage. One of the key things of being an entrepreneur, as opposed to being a worker, of course, is that you have control over your own wage. You can say, well, if I want to do this job, here is the sort of sum I need to do it. And again, the reality of work in the platform economy is that work is nearly always priced by consumers or by the platforms. So in the case of recent Uber litigation, for example, in London, one of the things that Uber kept trying to emphasize to the tribunal, and which is discussed in the judgment in great length, is that its drivers are completely free to negotiate the price with the consumer. Completely free to negotiate the price with the consumer, that is, subject to the limit, the upper limit, which the app suggests. So next time you are in an Uber and you have a ride that costs you five pounds, well, remember that you can negotiate the price and you can say to the driver, actually, you know what, I'd like to pay you three pounds rather than five pounds. As you can imagine, the London Employment Tribunal was not particularly impressed with these sorts of arguments and said that the reality of this is that workers are very much wage takers and have no influence at all over the remuneration levels on these platforms. And sometimes remuneration levels are shockingly low. Amazon Mechanical Turk is probably the extreme illustration of that, where the majority of tasks posted on the platform pay one or two or three US cent for a job that will take you anywhere between two and 10 minutes to complete. So you're looking at an extremely low level of wages. The same is true for a lot of other people who work in the on-demand economy. One of the reasons for that is that you don't get paid while you're looking for work, right? When you're Uber driver on the streets of London, you don't get paid for that time looking for the next ride. When you sit on one of these online platforms and you click through a list of different tasks to see which one matches your skills, you don't get paid for that time. And of course, you don't get paid for any of the tools that you have to bring to the job, whether it's your car, whether it's your petrol, whether it's your insurance and other related costs. Related to that problem of wages and a sort of very high degree of control, is a problem of unpredictability, is a problem of huge uncertainty about what sort of work will be available and even what sort of income you get. Remember I said earlier that the platforms keep sort of developing their business model, keep changing the way the relationship is organized. 
And of course, again, whereas historically, if you wanted to change how your business was run or how you paid people or what they had to do, you had to sit down with representatives of the workers, you had to negotiate a change in the contract of employment. Well, now, all you do is you update the app. You say to people, oh, you need to download the new version of the app. And suddenly, you've completely changed your business model. So one real problem that doesn't get talked about a lot is this unpredictability from week to week. If you work in the on-demand economy, you can put in exactly the same amount of hours, the same amount of effort, week after week, and your earnings can be all over the place, depending on what the business model is that week, depending also on what percentage, in terms of commission, the platforms decide to take. So something else you see fairly consistently is that when a platform goes new into a market they aren't established yet, they actually pay fairly well. They take fairly low commissions. And then as they become more established, as they start to gain market power, the prices for consumers go up a bit, and crucially, the percentage cut taken by the platform also increases, without the workers having any real recourse to that. And then finally, and this is at this point in time at least more true of other jurisdictions than the EU, you see an increasing amount of anti-union and anti-litigation provisions in there. So in the United States, for example, most platforms now insist that if you want to work for them, or indeed if you want to use them as a consumer, you have to agree to individual arbitration, which means crucially that any kind of lawsuit is brought entirely confidentially and has no binding precedent value. You can't have a clause class action, and usually, even if you win, you can't even talk about it afterwards and inform other consumers or inform other workers of what happened. So when you compare this list of sort of what life is really like in the on-demand economy with these great promises, then, well, it might be true for some workers that the on-demand economy is great, but it's equally true that for other workers, it's pretty grim and it's more reminiscent of sort of 18th century work than it is of the future of the labor market. And, and I think this is an important story that we employment lawyers sometimes forget, these problems are not just problems for workers, they're also problems for consumers and the market at large. One of the increasing issues with on-demand economy services is that their quality can be quite low. And it makes sense, if I pay somebody to transcribe something for a few minutes and I pay them one cent, well, they're not going to put their back into it. They'll do the minimum possible and get out and get away with it. And so on Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example, between a third and half of the jobs are not done to sufficient quality that the consumer actually accepts them. <laughs> Same sort of thing more broadly, if you get into an Uber, where somebody has been driving on the streets for 12 hours just to actually be able to earn enough money for the day, well, you're going to have some issues with health and safety about them being tired and on the streets. Same is also true for these cheap prices. As I've already said, these business models very often are cheap initially to, as it were, buy and acquire market share, but then once that's established, the prices go up dramatically. And the best illustration of that is what happened to ride-sharing services in China. So for a long time, Didi, a big Chinese operator, and Uber were in a bitter competition over the Chinese market for understandable reasons. Great business if you can provide transportation services to millions and millions of people in big Chinese cities. Eventually, Uber lost that battle. They had lost more than a billion US dollars in subsidies, and they essentially decided to get out of the market. Within about 24 hours, prices for ride-sharing services in Beijing had doubled because the subsidies were withdrawn and the product shot up in price. Finally, there's a huge issue in terms of consumer protection, in terms of redress, if something goes wrong. If you walk across the street in London and, heaven forbid, you get hit by a bus, well, you're not going to end up suing the bus driver who won't have any money to pay your costs and your hospital expenses. You're going to sue Transport for London, the employer, for vicarious liability. If you get hit by an Uber and you try to sue the platform, the first thing Uber will do is turn around and say, sorry, we've got nothing to do with this. We're just an app. We're just an introduction agency. The business is the actual worker himself. And so that then 
becomes, I think, to a certain extent, the problem for society at large. Also for the businesses, for example, who use these kinds of platforms. At the end of the day, because of the low quality and the lack of control, you end up having much higher transaction cost. You sometimes need to then get people to monitor the work being done. Amazon Mechanical Turk, by the way, has a solution for you there. You simply get another MTurker and pay them one cent to check the work that the earlier MTurker did for another cent. And of course, you have all the sort of more traditional problems that you see in terms of a fear of a loss of intellectual property, in terms of staff turnover and the associated cost. So, I think then, from a legal perspective, what we need to ask ourselves is when it comes to the business models of these on-demand economy platforms, what's going on? Is it genuinely innovation or is it regulatory arbitrage, which is at the core of their business models? And of course, the reality is, and I cannot overemphasize this point, heterogeneity in the business models. Some elements of the on-demand economy are genuine innovation in terms of using the phones to get rid of a lot of traditional transactions. But other elements of the platforms are clearly built around regulatory arbitrage, around breaking the law. And this is a great story I came across in the course of my research for the book, where in Silicon Valley, there are these sort of startup competitions. We've got a panel of investors and then people go and pitch to them. So everybody gets five minutes and can say, here's my cool new business model, please give me some money to invest. And one of these investors, who has sort of done years and years of these pitching events, said more and more often, the investors had to ask the people presenting the business model, but is this even legal? And the cool answer, the sort of hipster answer you wanted to give was to say, well, not yet. And I think that should give us some pause for thought. If disruptive innovation is generally disruptive innovation, or it's more saying, actually, we're just going to ignore what the legal regulation is. So what should we do about it? How can we tackle these problems of work in the on-demand economy? Well, we haven't got time for detailed policy proposals, but we have got time for, I think, one key, one really important message. And that is that even though there is this language of gigs and tasks and rides and hits, human intelligence tasks, at the end of the day, this is work. And our starting point for regulation should be to say this is work and it should be regulated as such. I think it's really important that as lawyers we don't fall into these traps of technological exceptionalism, of saying we should completely reinvent the wheel, but rather we should say well, actually, the technology is new here, but most of the problems we see, we actually have known for quite a long time. And to give you a reminder of this, you can think about and take home, let me introduce you to an amazing innovation, the first chess computer in the world, introduced in the 18th century, the 18th century at the court of Maria Therese in Vienna, the Mechanical Turk. This was an actual computer who could play chess against a human being. Well, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. It turned out, upon detailed inspection, that inside this computer, this mechanical Turk machine, there was a little compartment where a little person was hiding and moving the chess pieces around to making it look as if the Turk, the machine, were playing chess. And I think today, when we all glued to our iPhones and our screens, and we think, oh, is this nice? I can just order this stuff, a car, or whatever it might be, through our app. Remember that at the end of the day, there is somebody somewhere actually having to move the pieces around, actually having to do the work. And so the mechanical Turk, in a sense, is just as important today as it was in the 18th century. Final thing, briefly to talk about, is just to say, well, what's going on about this? Obviously, more and more regulators, more and more sort of public debates are waking up to the fact that there are some great advantages of this, but there are also some problems with work in the on-demand economy, and then we need to do something about it. And so at the international level, for example, both the ILO and the European Union have begun to become quite heavily involved with this. The ILO, 
as many of you will know, have recently published a very good, very big report on non-standard forms of work. And they've actually been really at the forefront of doing some work on the on-demand economy in particular, both from a legal perspective and a sort of broader socioeconomic perspective. And it's also feeding very much into the Future of Work initiative, the sort of big frameworks for the upcoming celebrations of the ILO centenary. The European Union has also been at it. The Commission had a sharing economy agenda document, fairly high level, sort of not really with any binding legal import. Some bits of it are quite good, other bits of it are a bit more spurious, I think. It's still an interesting document for you to look at, I think, because it gives you an idea of what the sort of challenges are beyond just employment. Huge challenges in terms of market access, huge challenges in terms of consumer protection, huge challenges in terms of taxation as well. With the social pillar, of course, during the consultation, we had a whole stream on the future of work, on how some of these norms in the social pillar would work in the on-demand economy. One big topic, for example, is working time regulation. When is an Uber driver working? So the platforms say, well, even if you found that they were working for us, at the very least, we insist that they only work for us in the very moments that they're actually using the app. So it's real questions as to how we can enforce and apply some of these standards to these new forms of work. And then there's the Court of Justice in 434.15, the elite taxi case coming from Spain, which is about the definition of Uber for internal market purposes. Are they, as the platform itself pushes very hard, merely an information technology service, or are they actually a transport provider? The reason that is very important in this particular case is because it matters in terms of regulatory competence. If they're genuinely an information service product, then there's very limited competence for the member states to regulate them, and there's lots of sort of assumption of freedom of service provision. Domestically, things are happening in a lot of different member states as well. France, for example, has got quite a lot of litigation. Germany has sort of interesting policy initiatives. The country I know most about, and in fact where we've seen the most litigation, is the United Kingdom. And I think it's no surprise that the gig economy has risen and grown the biggest and the fastest in the UK labour market. Because the baseline there was a very flexible labour market, a very deregulated labour market, which allows experimentation with these sorts of business models. First out of the starting line was Uber, being sued by a couple of drivers who were insisting that they were workers and therefore entitled to a minimum set of rights, such as national minimum wage payments, such as anti-discrimination protection. And Uber, as you can imagine, says, of course you're not workers, we're not employing you, we are merely putting you in touch with passengers who want a ride, who want to share your car with you. And indeed, if you read the Uber terms and conditions carefully, amongst pages and pages of legalese, you suddenly find in capital letters and bold this assertion that this is a contract for services, this is independent service provision. And when this was tested in court in the United Kingdom, the court said, it's very clear here that this contractual term does not represent the reality of the business model and that in fact Uber was employing its drivers. The case is now pending under appeal, but judging the facts of it, I think it's very unlikely that it will be overturned. And we have in the meantime already seen a host of other decisions, cases like City Sprint, cases like Pimlico Plumbers, where the courts time and time again have found that workers in the on-demand economy are in fact not just independent service providers. Now, the one slight hitch or downside with that story, people always say, well, it's great that you give some worker protection to these drivers, to these on-demand economy workers. Well, remember that they're not employees. And remember that in the United Kingdom, we have this slightly curious tripartite scheme of employment rights, where this middle category, the worker category, is only entitled to a certain basic floor of rights, a certain basic floor of protection. And that therefore, actually, I felt a bit bad for doing this, but when everybody was celebrating the Uber judgment, my sort of key take on it was to say, well, at the end of the day, they're not much more now 
than zero hours contract workers, which in and of itself has a huge set of issues in terms of the labor market. It's a huge political issue. The government is very aware, I think, of some of the problems with working the on-demand economy, with what it is doing to the workplace of the future. And so I think just about every UK government department now has its own inquiry set up. There's a parliamentary inquiry, and the Prime Minister has also set up the so-called Taylor Review to look into how we can respond to these forms of work. Finally, and I suppose for employment law is more a footnote than a key issue in my discussion, there is the tax law issues surrounding this. Some countries, including the UK, actually have differential national insurance taxation for the self-employed. And so actually that becomes a massive subsidy to these platforms' business models. Because actually they can compete much more efficiently because they have to pay a lower cost than somebody who employs a traditional workforce. Another big issue, and the litigation has just started on this in the UK, is VAT. So one of Uber's key arguments is to say, we don't have to pay VAT because every driver is her own mini business and none of them, of course, meet the £90,000 income per year which you need to cross before you have to become VAT registered. And so Uber, right out of the get-go, in a sense, can compete with other businesses with an advantage of 20% by saying, actually, we're not providing any services, therefore, you don't have to pay any value-added tax. And that's now being challenged in litigation. So, to conclude, I want to leave you with three ideas, three sort of takeaway points that we can use as a starting point for our discussion. First, this idea that from the employment law perspective, while the technology is new, a lot of the challenges we're looking at are not. Second, that I think it's really important that in trying to regulate these platforms, we have to make sure to be committed to supporting innovation. We can't regulate these platforms by saying they should go away. We can't say we should just ban this form of work. There is some real promise in some of these business models. There is some real new, interesting, good stuff in the technology. But the way we have to support innovation is just as we don't say, let's get rid of them, we also shouldn't say, well, they're just completely different and they should just be allowed to do whatever they want. I think the key focus in any kind of regulatory efforts here has to be a, to create a level playing field for these businesses and to say that the same sort of regulation, the same sort of standards apply to all employers. And finally, I think there's a really important story that we can tell that this sort of employment regulation, which creates a level playing field and fosters innovation, will be good not just for the workers, but actually it will also help consumers and businesses at large. Thank you very much.